Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the All Wise, the True, and the Living God, who we believe visited North America in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. We thank him for coming. We thank him from, for raising from the midst of the mentally dead the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we thank the both of them today for, our, for their servant to us in our midst today, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In their names and in the names of the righteous, we offer the greeting words of peace. as alaikum. Happy Savior's Day. Happy Savior's Day sir. How old is Master Farad Muhammad? hundred and thirty four years old so let's give him a hand for for his one hundred and thirty fourth birthday making him the oldest living human being on our planet isn't that something think how old the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is. We see Minister Farrakhan, 77 years old. But does he look like he's 77 years old? Does he act like he's 77 years old? Does he feel like he's 77 years old? And look around you among the Muslims, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, some of us advanced in age, up in our 80s and 90s, but bouncing around like teenagers almost. So that is the aim and the purpose of how to eat to live. To expand and extend the lifespan of the righteous. We have been reared in a wicked old world that has forgotten and never knew about the God wisdom that is behind how to eat to live, which gives the human being an unlimited lifespan, that wisdom, knowledge, and understanding has been held back for the past 6,000 years. And now on the coming of Master Farad Muhammad, in answer to the prophecy of Jesus that I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he comes and presents us this life-giving teachings, how to eat to live. Don't you want to live a long time? Yes, sir. Did everybody answer? Yes, sir. You might not want to live a long time if you don't have a purpose for living. But we have a purpose, don't we? Because we are those who are charged with the responsibility of bringing in a whole new world. Bringing in a whole new civilization. Well, Master Farad Muhammad better know how uh, to eat to live. He can't die. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad better know how to eat to live. He can't die before his job is done. What about you? Can you afford to leave here before your job is done? We are of the righteous and we all have a divine mission and purpose for living. There's something that we are to do. More than just uh, maybe attending your FOI or MGT class. More than just attending the mosque. That's how you get started. But when you get into Islam, then Islam makes you acquainted with yourself. And when you discover who you yourself are, then along with that comes the knowledge of your purpose and your mission in life. And suppose you were to discover that in order for you to fulfill your purpose for living, that you needed to hang around for 200 years. Well, and then what sense would it make to drop your body at 70 years? Wouldn't that be a cruel hoax? Got a job that takes 200 years and you die at 70. That wouldn't be right, would it? Talk back to me. Yeah, you know that wouldn't be right. And so Allah comes and he gives us a teaching that if it is put into practice, 
then it would allow us to have control over life so that we could treat life like a spigot where we turn it on and leave it on for as long as we want and then turn it off when we get ready to turn it off. Talk back to me now. As opposed to trying to live life and you're out of control. Like a passenger in a car and the car don't have a driver. <laughs> and wherever the car goes, that's where you end up. Well, more than likely, a car without a driver ends up where? In a ditch. In a crash. In a disaster. And if you look around, what you see in the lives of most people is a disaster. Either a disaster that has already happened or a disaster that's getting ready to happen. I hope that doesn't include you, but I'm afraid it does include most of you because you're living life without control. There are forces that are controlling you and me rather than we controlling the forces. See, how to eat to live cannot be practiced by a slave. Because when you're a slave, then someone controls your time. So when it's the right time for you to eat, your boss man may say, you, you can't take a break now. You got to do something for me. A slave can't practice how to eat to live. How to eat to live is for free men and free women who control their own lives. All praise is due to Allah. So we want to begin our plenary session on how to eat to live. And I'm very, very excited on this Savior's Day, February 26, 2011. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The exact birth date yes, of Master Farad Muhammad. Yes, to have an opportunity to reacquaint you with the principles and practices of how to eat to live. Now, we want to start where we should start. We should start with the reading of the book. So, or books. If you have not read the books, then you should do that right away. As Soon as you get back home, you need to put yourself into intensive study and read the books. And now we know how to study a little bit better, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna clear you're going to do what? You're going to clear the words so you don't have a misunderstood. Now, I'm going to help clear some of the words. What we want to accomplish today is an alignment of the principles and the practice of how to eat to live with your own life. See, you're already living a life. You have a life, you have a lifestyle, you have somewhere that you live, you have a family, you have a job, you have something that occupies your time. Well now, there has to be an alignment between all of that which is a reality and the practice and the principles of how to eat to live. Does that make sense? So the goals and purposes of how to eat to live are clear to prepare a people to bring in a new civilization because the race is not to the swift nor the strong the race is to to whom those who endure to the end the end of what the end of this rebuilding process to bring in a new world you must live 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, 500 years, otherwise you won't accomplish your mission. So the goals and purposes have to be aligned with a system, a process, a plan. You could say rules of the road how am I supposed to do this in a successful manner well that's why you have to read the books the books give you the rules 
Now, how to eat to live can be presented in a real complicated way or it can be presented real simple. Which one do you prefer? Simple. We'll get to the complicated part later. But right now, real simple. How to eat to live is based on two principles. Fasting and the right food. One, two. Fasting and the right food. Now, what does fasting mean? Well, fasting is where you refrain from food and drink. That's what a fast is. You don't eat anything, including mints, candies, juice. The only exception that you can put in your mouth during a fast according to the rules as laid out in How to Eat to Live is coffee and water. Didn't say tea. You added that. You say, well, I don't like coffee. Well, then don't drink it. It didn't say you had to drink coffee, but you could. And you could even put a little sugar and a little cream in your coffee, and it would not break the fast. But anything else other than water breaks your fast. So if you're chewing gum, eating a mint, having some candy, having a little uh, uh, bit of juice or something like that during the day, you are not fasting. You just broke your fast. You can't claim that you're eating one meal a day. You would have to say, well, how many mints did I actually eat? How much juice did I actually drink? Okay, if it was 10, then you had 10 meals that day. So the rules are simple. See, you said you didn't want it complicated, right? You wanted it simple. That, that's how simple it is. You don't eat anything. Or drink anything other than coffee or water uh, between your one meal a day or one meal every other day or one meal every three days. And how far could you go with that? You could actually go up to one meal once a week. Now that's for advanced practitioners. I wouldn't say that I'm ready to do that. I'm struggling with one meal a day. After all these years, you say, well, how long you been in the nation? Well, I've been in the nation 42 years, and I'm still struggling with one meal a day. What difference does it make if it takes me 40 years to master one meal a day since I'm going to live 900 years? I don't have to get in a hurry and do it by next week. There's no compulsion in religion. How to eat to live is not an exercise in willpower. I'm going to make myself not eat. Well, that's a miserable life, isn't it? All you're doing is making yourself hungry. So fasting means one meal a day, one meal every other day. And how to eat to live also includes a monthly fast, which could go for two days or three days every month. Now, what about the fast of Ramadan? Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, me and my followers, we don't even consider Ramadan to be a fast. All they're doing is switching the meal hours from daylight to nighttime. And they eat all night. What's a fast about that? That's not a fast. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his followers, they fast 365 days a year, eating one meal a day. Now, what about the right food? Well, one way of looking at how to eat to live, the books is, it's a long list of the right foods and the wrong foods. You could think of it like, okay, what would be at the very top of the list of right foods and then go all the way down, and as you go down the list, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, and all the way on the bottom, there would be that nasty pig. Right? Are you following me? All food is not equally good or equally bad. What's the best food uh, among the foods that are right and lawful for us to eat? What are the three best foods? Navy beans, whole wheat, and pure milk, raw milk. Those are the top three. So anyone that is attempting to practice how to eat to live and leave those three out is not actually practicing how to eat to live. That's like playing basketball and you forget the basketball. Oh, I don't like, I don't like that ball. I'm playing basketball. I don't like the ball, though. 
I'm playing tennis, but I ain't bringing no racket. That wouldn't make sense, would it? So a practitioner of how to eat to live should have raw milk every day or with every meal. Should have bean soup with every meal. And should have whole wheat with every meal. Otherwise, we would have to question your practice. Some of us, we eat macaroni and cheese with every meal, right? <laughs> Some of us eat rice with every meal. Down on Elijah Muhammad said, if you must eat rice, then brown it. But he said, if you must, since you're from the south and you used to eating rice, if you must continue that old slave habit of eating rice, then brown it. <laughs> that way it won't hurt you as much as it otherwise would hurt you. See, these are the things that we have to get straight and in alignment. We don't want to accept that which is inferior to the neglect of that which is supreme. So if raw milk and raw honey and whole wheat and navy beans are the supreme standard, the gold standard of food, then we don't want to say, well, let's shove that to the side now. That's not important. Uh, and let's get in something else. Because anything else that you bring in after that is inferior to what you just shoved aside. Does that make sense? Everybody all right? <laughs> so fasting with the right foods. Now here we have a problem. Because not only did Master Farad Muhammad bring how to eat to live, but he also brought something else. When he came and appeared among us in 1930, he also brought in the judgment. Have you heard about that? Yes, the judgment of America? Yes, and how the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote about the judgment is what? Now! So the judgment of America began in 1930, and if you are judging a wicked uh, government to destroy it for its wicked deeds, then one of the first things that you would touch would be the food supply, wouldn't you? I mean, in a war, if your enemies hold up in a fort somewhere, what do you want to, what do, you want to do? You want to put a siege around it, right? So no food can get in there. And after a while, when they start getting hungry in there, what are they going to do? They're going to surrender. So since 1930, America has been under siege. What Allah did, he caused the wind to blow. And he caused what's in history is recorded as the great dust bowl. Have you heard about that? That's where Allah made the wind blow so hard and so long in the midst of a drought. It dried out all of the topsoil in the heartland of America and blew all of the topsoil into the Atlantic Ocean, destroying America's ability to feed herself and you. That was the birth of chemical agriculture, where the scientists said, we can't grow any more food. There's going to be starvation. And then some smart scientist said, well, well, we can trick the plants into growing. All we have to do is give them these chemicals. And so since 1930, America's agriculture has been an, a chemical agriculture producing chemicalized food, which does not have the ability to sustain and nourish the human being. Are you listening? So maybe that's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, get your mouth out of the white man's kitchen. Because Allah has cursed his kitchen, reducing his ability to produce food that is able to nourish you and sustain you. So here's where the trick comes in. You got how to eat to live, and you're reading the list of foods that you're allowed to have, and then you go into whole foods or Giant, or Safeway, or Kroger, or whatever supermarket it is, and you buying 
from them was mentioned in how to eat to live thinking that that carrot that's in the whole foods is the same as the carrot that master Farad Muhammad meant uh, when he taught the honorable Elijah Muhammad back in the 30s that carrot that you find out there today is nowhere close to being the carrot that was in the market in 1930 it looks like a carrot but it ain't a carrot the studies have shown that you would have to eat four or five carrots today to equal one carrot in 1950. Not to mention 1930. Are you following what I'm saying? So some of us, we're actually following uh, the right list of right foods. We got the list down. We know what to buy, but we're buying it from the enemy who's under the judgment of Allah and his food is no more good. Are you listening to me? So then the real practice of how to eat to live cannot begin until we begin to produce our own food. Are you following me? You cannot practice how to eat to live buying food from other people. They can't sell you. They cannot produce what you need. They cannot give you what Allah himself intends to give you. you you're not getting my point. No, you're not. You're not getting my point. See, what does the Bible say about all these things? It says that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. The Lord God himself down on his hands and knees in the mud. Not praying. Planting. For what purpose? to produce food. He created life. Well, that's great, Allah. But how are you going to keep the life going? Well, you keep the life going by producing the food that the life needs. What happens if the life that's created does not get the right food? It dies. It suffers and dies. It weakens. It becomes disabled. It becomes disease and ultimately it dies because the life cannot sustain itself without food. We live in a commercialized world that makes everything into a business. Food is not a business. Food is life itself. Look at your body. Go on and look. You have one, right? Well, the question is, are you going to keep it? You won't keep it if you don't feed it. It's just, be just like the cat you got at home. What happens to the cat if you won't feed it? It'll leave. <laughs> well, that's what your body's doing. When you don't feed it, it starts to leave. Bit by bit, piece by piece. Look at your body. Your body is the result of nutrition. You are today what you ate yesterday. If you was eating good, you would look good today. So we don't have to have any mystery about it. The reason you look so bad is because you don't eat good. You're eating bad and it makes you look bad. It makes your body bad. It makes your body hurt. It makes you limp. It makes you have a headache. It makes you have a stroke. It makes your stomach ache. Because you're not eating right. Your skin ain't right. Your hair is not right. Your nails break off. You can't remember. Why? Because your diet is wrong. Allah didn't create us to suffer pain and disease or even death until we choose it so he planted a garden he didn't leave it to somebody else to plant the garden the work of planting the garden is so important that God himself has to do it himself well where would the Lord God plant a garden today to save his people today well answer back Lord God
So I don't think they got that, brother. No, they ain't get that. They waiting on the Lord God to plant something for them. They don't realize they the Lord God. Who is Allah? The black man of Asia, right? Well, who are you? So how come you ain't planting the garden? You waiting on somebody else. People ask me, uh, what should I have in my survival kit? Well, how long you intend to survive? If you intend to survive for eternity, then you, your survival kit is called the farm, or you're going to hear about hoop houses. That's your survival kit. See, they'd be thinking about it in some other kind of way. What do you mean? Uh, I'm going to have a six-month survival kit because that's how long it's going to take the white man to get back in power after Allah brings him down. Then he's going to start feeding me again after six months. Really? No, I don't think he ever going to get back up. That's the way I heard it. He ain't never coming back. This modern Babylon has fallen, fallen to rise no more. So if we are totally dependent on what modern Babylon feeds us in order to sustain our lives, then we won't have life. Maybe that's why the prophecy says, I am come that they might have life. Which of course implies maybe they won't. Because maybe they won't listen to me. Maybe they won't do what they need to do. Maybe they will play lip service to how to eat to live. They will say one thing out of their mouth, but they won't actually practice it. Even though the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, mere belief counts for nothing unless it's carried into practice. How to eat to live don't mean nothing unless it's carried into what? Practice. And you can't practice it eating somebody else's inferior quality food. You got to get into the food production business. So when we look at the hoop house, we're going to show a video. And it's uh, the founder of Growing Power. Some of you know Will Allen. How many of you are taking Will Allen's course in Milwaukee at Growing Power? Would you please stand up? There's about eight or nine people from the nation. Brother John here and myself did it last year. But we need to learn that technology of how to produce food where we are. So you might not be living eastward in Eden. You might be in East Brooklyn. You might be in East LA. Well, you still got to eat. So you got to figure out how do I plant a garden where I am, where my family is, where my mosque is, so we can live here. Because if you run out of food where you are, then where are you going? You ain't going to stay home. Say, well, when the end comes, we're going to go to the mosque. What's at the mosque? You won't stay at the mosque if the mosque can't feed you. See, so we got to think about these things right. So Will Allen is going to speak to us about uh, what he calls the good food revolution. So he's coming with the technology to help us put how to eat to live into full practice. You cannot buy the food that is necessary for the Muslim to live. If you eat an inferior food, you will be an inferior Muslim or an inferior Christian. I did a lecture some years ago called The Problem is Nutrition. You want the people to act better, well then you got to feed them better. If you want them to be smarter and stronger, with more endurance, more stamina, more energy to get something done, you got to give them the food that produces that kind of outcome. But eating fast foods, refined foods, processed foods, industrialized foods, you can't be no Muslim on a diet like that. Not a good one. You'll be one, but you will be non-productive. Because you won't have the energy. You go home, I'm tired. I can't go to the mud. I'm tired. I can't sell no pay. I'm tired. And you will be tired. So he's going to introduce us to the technology 
of intensive commercial agriculture. And he's starting at the beginning, which is not growing food. One of the things you'll notice about life, before you can do something, there's always something else that you have to do first. So you might be all excited to grow some food, but before you grow some food, you got to grow the soil. There is no soil in America. Allah blew it all away. There is no soil that can produce the kind of food that you need. So the first thing you got to do is learn how to make dirt. That black dirt, that black mud that's spoken of in the Holy Quran. Who made that? Allah made that, didn't he? Well, now you got to learn how to make that because who are you? You are Allah, aren't you? Well, you can prove it by making some dirt, learning how to make dirt. So it's all about composting. And the, the, the animals that you have to raise, I don't want to raise no animals. Well, you ain't going to live then. You act like you a plant. No, you're not. I'm not calling you an animal either. But you're closer to what we would call an animal than you are to a plant. You're not even green. And if you get green, we think you're sick. Is that right? So you have to raise worms. That's your first livestock. Because the worms are going to convert the compost into that rich black soil. And it is from that soil that you are able to produce a supreme food product that will nourish your body. And then that law, you are what you eat. You're eating the supreme food that the earth can produce. You become supreme within yourself. And you enjoy a supreme quality of life. Does that sound good to you? Is that something that you want to do? Now here, i got to let you in on something. When I first went to Growing Power last year, when I walked in there, I thought I was in the Garden of Eden. Then when I saw Will Allen, he's like 6'9 or something like that. He's a, he's a literal giant. I, I, I thought I was looking at God. I said, wow, look at this brother. I'm just telling you the truth. And I realized I was in the right place. I started thinking about it. I said, well, up there on the mother plane, they probably have something like a hoop house. Right? Or do you think that they dip down and visit the 7-Eleven to stock up on some snacks? I don't think so. That's a human-built planet, which means they have to have some kind of a food-growing system on the mother plane. Well, now, we're not on the mother plane, but we're on this earthly plane. So where's our food-growing system? Well, Will Allen's hoop house concept, and he'll say it like that. He's nothing new in it. He, he, he doesn't claim that he invented anything that other people weren't doing. But what he actually did do is he put it together into a system that works. And the one thing I want you to pay attention to is how easy it all is. You don't have to have a degree in agriculture to do it. And the thing that Will Allen always ended every class with was a question to the students. Can you do this? And if, and if it looked like somebody didn't know if they could do it, then he would go back into it because the whole thing was you have to do it. You are the one to do it. It has to be uh, understood by you. It has to be in your hands. It has to be in your control. You are the one that has to make it happen. There is nobody else to come and save you. You have already received what's coming to you from outside. Now you have to look on the inside and develop on the inside so that you can save yourself and others. So I told Mr. Allen, I said, after I began to understand what he was trying to do, I said, I... I'm going to set a goal and a purpose where this is concerned. I said, Mr. Allen, I'm one of your disciples. And within the next year to two years, I'm going to see to it, inshallah, that there are 100 to 200 hoop houses built and functioning in America. Yeah. 
So I'm asking you to help me reach that goal. Because when I was thinking about 100 to 200 hoop houses, I was thinking about you. Because you got to eat. You see, so we want to build at least that number. But we can't think about just ourselves. We have to think about the whole community. Your family needs a hoop house. Your neighborhood needs a hoop house. Your church needs a hoop house. The mosque needs a hoop house. The school where your children go to school, they need a hoop house. Otherwise, you won't have the food that you need because 2011 looks like the year of famine. Food prices are expected to go up 400%. So when that happens, people start to riot like they're doing over in the Middle East. So we're going to have uh, Mr. Allen's video. It's a 37-minute uh, video presentation. He wanted to be here, but he had a previous engagement. He could not get out of that engagement. And so he went into the studio, well, actually into his greenhouse, and he filmed a presentation. He's talking to you. So if we could have that video, please. Hello, uh, my name is Will Allen. I'm the uh, I'm a farmer. I'm also the founder and the CEO of an organization called Growing Power, uh, which was established in uh, 1995. Uh, we're sitting here um, in one of our greenhouses uh, on the property. Uh, we're in, actually in greenhouse number five, where you probably hear the rushing of water. Uh, we have over a hundred thousand gallons of. Uh, uh, water where we raise uh, two types of fish. We raise uh, yellow perch or lake perch that you'll find in Lake Michigan. Uh, we also raise uh, tilapia. Hello, uh, my name is Will Allen. I'm the uh, I'm a farmer. I'm also the founder and the CEO of an organization called Growing Power, uh, which was established in uh, 1995. Uh, we're sitting here um, in one of our greenhouses uh, on the property. Uh, we're in, actually in greenhouse number five, where you probably hear the rushing of water. Uh, we have over 100,000 gallons of uh, uh, water where we raise uh, two types of fish. We raise uh, yellow perch or lake perch that you'll find in Lake Michigan. Uh, we also raise uh, tilapia. So we raise over 100,000 uh, fish annually in these greenhouses and uh, that's part of our integrated uh, uh, food system uh, that we have at Growing Power. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, uh, about me and my background. I actually grew up on a farm right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm the son of uh, a South Carolina sharecropper who uh, dropped his plow and mule uh, back in the 30s and uh, moved during the great migration of uh, African-American folks to uh, uh, the northern cities and Midwestern cities for a so-called better life. Uh, but unlike many of the African-American males that left farming in those days uh, for industrial jobs, uh, for some reason my father wanted myself and my brothers to uh, uh, learn about where our food comes comes from and carry on the tradition of uh, farming. And that's how I learned uh, to do what I uh, do today uh, from my parents. On my mother's side, also from uh, around Aiken, South Carolina, <clears throat> her family uh, has a long history, about 400 years of uh, being involved in agriculture. Uh, so I have a rich uh, agricultural background and the type of agriculture that I'm gonna be talking to you about today and showing you uh, at our greenhouses here, uh, you know, is uh, kind of a different kind of agriculture in that it's uh, more intensive in production and year round and food being grown inside the city to feed thousands of people. Uh, I wish I was uh, uh, there with you uh, to speak to you in person. Uh, but um, I had a uh, earlier uh, previous engagement that I was committed to, uh, so I'm sorry I, I, I can't be there, but uh, imagine that, that I'm there in spirit with you all. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I hope you have a, a wonderful conference. I know it, and we also have uh, 
a greenhouse, uh, a hoop house there to kind of give you a visual of how we grow our food and uh, the types of uh, structures, one of the types of structures uh, that you can uh, put up very quickly and start growing food. But I want to tell you a little bit about uh, this facility that I purchased in uh, uh, 1993. And I purchased this facility to sell my uh, farm produce that I grow. I uh, farm a 100-acre farm south of here uh, in Oak Creek, about 45 minutes. Uh, and back in those days, in 1993, I also had a corporate job. I was working for Procter & Gamble. And when I made that, the purchase of this facility, which is the last remaining farm in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, this farm uh, was a 19th century far farm, and uh, the greenhouses here were constructed, uh, A-frame greenhouses, in the late 1920s. Uh, this area was at that time called uh, uh, Granville Township. And in the 30s, Milwaukee annexed the land, and it became a part of uh, the city of Milwaukee. But it's a historical farming area uh, where we're sitting here today. And uh, these old greenhouses have continued to grow food uh, for all those years. Uh, what makes it uh, possible for us to do what we do is the fact that these greenhouses have never been out of business. I'm the third owner of the facility, and the uh, previous uh, two owners never had a break in their, in their operation. Uh, so we're able to, from a grandfathering uh, clause, be able to do what we do in terms of raising animals and doing some of the things that uh, we do today. Uh, and to describe what we do today, um, and the continuum that we moved uh, along, when I bought this uh, facility. I bought it for uh, pretty much selfish reasons of selling my farm produce. produce. Two years into the uh, project, um, I helped a youth group from the YWCA. And uh, out of that, uh, I had some friends that said, well, since you like, uh, you know, working with kids, which I do, uh, you should start a nonprofit. So uh, that's how I got sucked into this work, is uh, working with with kids, they'll do it to you every time. Uh, so along that continuum, uh, I volunteered uh, for the early years, and I started adding uh, more pieces to what I call the farm system, the farm system puzzle, uh, where I kept adding uh, more pieces to the puzzle, uh, mainly to support the pieces that I already knew about in my over. Uh, uh, 34 years of farming here in uh, Wisconsin and over 50 years overall, I kept adding these pieces that enhanced the pieces that I already had. Uh, and uh, along that journey, uh, from those earlier early years of 1993 to today, uh, we now uh, have 15 farms, um, uh, with this being our national headquarters and over 60 employees and we have 12 regional training centers around the U.S. Uh, as we spread the word uh, and teach people over a thousand farmers a year uh, around the U.S. and around the world. Uh, so this is our kind of the center of our universe, this farm. And it's very important spiritually in terms of uh, uh, what we're doing here because uh, part of the work that we do here is I, I wouldn't totally say it's farming. It's about using uh, the food system and providing food for over 15,000 people in our uh, area here in Milwaukee uh, to uh, the growing uh, a community. So we're doing more than just growing food and growing soil and growing all of the things that we grow, but we're growing community and uh, helping to create a sustainable community because I don't believe that we can have a sustainable community unless we have a sustainable food system. So uh, I just want to kind of put in context and frame what I think is happening uh, with our food system. I think everybody knows that our food system is broken, that uh, much of the food that we eat uh, is being produced, uh, being produced by industrial agriculture and um, much of the food that many people who live in these food deserts like uh, uh, this area, and oh, oh, by the way, this area also is a food desert. 
you have to travel over four miles for a retail grocery store, four miles north, south, east, and west. Uh, so uh, we're truly a, a food desert. Five blocks away is Milwaukee's largest housing project called West Lawn. It's being deconstructed right now and would be put back uh, together as a, uh, a multi-use, uh, multi-income facility, uh, which may be a good thing. Uh, we're involved in that project in that we will be managing the community gardens in that community so people will be able to grow their own food. We're also uh, involved in talks with the Housing Authority uh, to uh, build a 20,000 uh, square foot uh, grocery store uh, that would supply really healthy food for the community. Uh, so, um, so that's what's happening in, in, in this local community. But uh, going back to how we started in terms of working with the, the youth, uh, I think that is kind of the cornerstone of our work. Even though we're a multicultural, multi generational uh, organization led by a person of color, which is a rarity uh, in uh, the work that we do, and really with organizations uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, but the young people that we work with was a way uh, for us to really get to know the community and get to know the adults in the community uh, through our youth corps. Uh, which we continue today working with kids. Some of these uh, young people that I worked with uh, years ago are now over 30 years old. And some of them actually work for our organization now. Uh, so that's been a very good thing to see uh, those young people learn about the food system and want to be a part of it, but also to change their lives. Uh, because that's what uh, the work that we do here in Milwaukee, the work that we do in Chicago, which is another one of our big growing areas uh, where we have farms at Cabrini Green and on the south side at Algalt Gardens as well as uh, uh, Grant Park. We have two acre farm and our new farm that we're developing uh, across, from, across the river from Bridgeport uh, called Iron Street. So uh, our work is really centered around our young people uh, and has really helped us to uh, move our organization along and make those connections. Uh, so what's happening today as I move forward and move through those, uh, along those continuums from, uh, say, uh, uh, 1993 and the turn of the century and, uh, to today, uh, we've really grown as an organization. Uh, but also the movement has turned into what I call the Good Food Revolution. Uh, it's really become a revolution where many folks uh, that were involved in farming, maybe in the South, especially people of color or immigrants that uh, came across and uh, were persecuted and far lost their farms, are now wanting to get back into agriculture uh, for a number of reasons, for health reasons, for uh, financial reasons, for many, many uh, very positive reasons that we should control the food that we put in our bodies. And again, uh, food is the most important thing to our lives. That's the way I feel. And like I said before, there's no way for us to build these safe, sustainable communities unless we grow local food. So this is about growing local food, having folks partic participate from all levels uh, in, this, uh, in this work that we do. So engaging the community is like the first thing that we do. The first thing that I did when I uh, started doing this work and, and the way we did it was through the youth that we hired because they were the catalyst to get their uh, uh, parents involved. And, and uh, before we knew it, we were anchored into the community. We were looked at as an asset to this local community because we worked with just about every uh, young person in this community. And that's what really helped us to grow our organization. And, and then we started getting anchored in the entire Milwaukee community. And, uh, so we started uh, uh, being looked at by the city officials and corporate companies and others as an important part of Milwaukee. And we started bringing in uh, positive uh, publicity to Milwaukee through our trainings and our work. And, uh, some of the uh, distinctions that we were starting to get from outside of the community. 
So people started looking at Milwaukee in a different kind of way. Uh, as a matter of fact, today we're, we're looked at as the urban ag capital of the world. And I think that's uh, something we're very proud of, and we, we've kind of led that process to, for Milwaukee to be called the urban ag capital of the world. And uh, we're, we're, we do that uh, and hold that uh, dis distinction very uh, uh, modestly because uh, farming, one thing about farming, uh, it keeps you grounded because, uh, you know, one little bug or bad weather can pretty much put you out of business. So this is something that you do that will keep you very grounded and very uh, humble as you do your work uh, with the community. <clears throat> Part of this uh, revolution is about creating jobs and creating a new industry uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, hiring people in the, into this industry, not just one or two categories of jobs, but hundreds of categories of jobs and thousands of jobs overall. I see that happening in the next few years as this grows, because this is not a fad. The fact that now we have, like I said before, people of color, we have black folks, uh, uh, brown folks, all kinds of folks wanting to be a part of this. Uh, 15 years ago when I uh, would go into a community, I would get asked, uh, uh, Will, why, why, why do you want to do this slave's work? Today I don't hear that. I hear people coming out and they're proud that uh, I'm doing this work and an organization and other people of color involved in this and I, I think this is uh, something that is very positive and something that will continue and grow because it is, it's growing all over the country. I have the opportunity to work in uh, communities almost in every city in, in America and get to speak to mayors and uh, presidents and uh, first ladies and so forth. So um, everybody uh, wants, to, wants to join what I call the Good Food Revolution, which is a grassroots revolution. It's a revolution that uh, top-down operators now want to become a part of. Universities, politicos, uh, uh, corporate companies, uh, educators, they want to become a part of this uh, good food revolution. So that's where we are today. Uh, what Growing Power is doing is we're going to be training over a thousand farmers a year through our workshops. Uh, folks are coming here to Milwaukee. We're going out on the road to our regional training centers around the country, which we have 12, and we're training people. Uh, we're producing uh, materials, anything that we come up with, that we create, is for to be disseminated to the public. We're not holding anything, putting stuff in the back closet uh, and hiding anything. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that this revolution grows and whatever we can do to make that happen uh, is very important. The other piece that's important about this work is that uh, we're not an organization that's going to come into a community and force our way in and say, what we do at Growing Power is right for your community. As a matter of fact, I don't leave this spot, this place, unless I'm invited into a community. And that's the process that happens. We invite people here for tours, over 15,000 last year, and workshops, and then we get invited into their communities, whether they're native communities, uh, inner city communities, small town communities, uh, suburban communities, because my personal fundamental belief is that everybody should have access to the same good, healthy food. And uh, we, we, we try to make that happen. If you come to our workshops, you will eat healthy food. Food that we produce, food that uh, our co-op members produce. We have over 300 members of our co-op and uh, those, that food uh, gets distributed by us. Uh, as well as the food that we grow. So it's really important that this revolution is about good food. Food that's grown without chemicals. And that we're able to get this food, the same food, whether you're low income, medium income, or you're a multi-millionaire, we want to make sure that that same food is uh, distributed. The, the, what's happening in our industrial system is that we're, we, our food 
as categories. You know, if you're poor, you can only get this because you only got these kind of stores and this really bad processed food or bad meat uh, goes to those communities. That has to end. And to make that happen, um, we also do work around social justice and food justice. And we operate an organization within Growing Power called uh, Growing Food and Justice. And we have an annual conference every fall. And we bring people together from all over the country and outside of the country to participate in developing uh, techniques that they can go back and uh, uh, change their communities to dismantle some of the racism that's in the food system. Uh, to do it in a multicultural way because uh, I don't think any individual or any group of, of people can do this without the help of everybody being involved. So we encourage that we do this in a very multicultural kind of way. Uh, but we have to set that example. And uh, it's very serious work. Uh, over a thousand people have joined. Uh, we should have over 500 at our conference in Milwaukee this coming uh, September, September 7th, 8th, 9th, uh, I believe are the dates. Uh, but you can find that information out on our website. Uh, because my memory is not so great all the time. You know, but I know it starts September 7th, and it lasts about three or four days. Uh, and it's a very important piece. So I want to welcome you all to come to that. I want to welcome you all to come to Growing Power uh, to see what we do. Because we have a very integrated food system here that we've created along a continuum. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I have this thing called the seven P's that I operate. Uh, and those seven P's, uh, two of them I'll give you, uh, 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 they're uh, patience and, and passion. Because this is very passion-driven work. It's not all about the money. Because I've seen money thrown at this before and uh, a year later those organizations are out of business. So this is a, this is a lifestyle. This is a passion thing. It's about... It's a spiritual piece to grow food and touch the soil because we all should touch the soil every day. Uh, that's how important that is, that aspect of this work is. So uh, whether we realize it or not, we, we're uh, people of the soil, people of the earth. And uh, I think that's important uh, for all of us to start to understand and embrace uh, because we'll be better off for that. And this, this work is about, about the people and how we, uh, how we uh, engage with each other and how we're able to bring people together uh, around the same table. They have everybody at the table. And that we're not just kicking people off because we don't like their color, their skin, or their politics, or religion, or whatever. This is about, this is a non-political thing when it comes to hunger. And we're in a state right now where we've got more hunger in America and more hunger around the world than ever before. It's a time when we look back that our government said, you farmers grow soybeans and corn from fence row to fence row, we're going to feed the world. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, I think the approach has to be on a local level. We have to feed ourselves. We have to take responsibility for feeding our families uh, and participate in some way. Not all of us are going to grow food, but we can we can we can participate by supporting the folks that are going to grow the food and grow the soil and so forth to make our communities uh, safe and happy and sustainable. So uh, again, uh, I wish I was there with you all. I I encourage you to get involved uh, with the revolution. I encourage you all to get involved with Growing Power because we would love to have you visit our facility at any time to participate in our workshops and our trainings uh, that we have and uh, uh, enjoy your gathering and really enjoy it and uh, I hope that uh, food is really uh, something that you'll start embracing and uh, using that as a, as a piece to grow your community. I'm also going to give you uh, a view of what our facilities like here in Milwaukee. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll get a taste of what we do here. Uh, 
Thank you and uh, have a great, uh, great gathering. And I look forward to seeing, I do know quite a few of you. And I want to get to know uh, many more of you uh, in the coming uh, days, weeks, and months, and years ahead. side. The beauty of these prototypes is that they're size neutral. We're watching a movie called Fresh in the lobby. Let's take a look at some of the photos. Local coffee. Coffee grounds are used in the compost. Let's go into greenhouse number one. Alright. This is where a lot of the meetings take place. Now let's go to greenhouse number two, where there's an aquaponics system. We'll be seeing many aquaponics systems on the short movie tour. I see the fish right now, but there are thousands. Below, plants feeding the fish, the fish feeding the plants. Okay, now we're in greenhouse number three where the worm bins are, vermiculture production. I'll show you some of the worm bins. They're really nice. Okay, and that's where there's some plants, but this is this is where the the dirt gets sifted. One of the places. There's a worm bin right here. Right, 
color. Little greenhouse number four. So there's uh, another aquaponic system as well as the uh, mushroom logs. Greenhouse number five, more extensive aquaponics. So, Will's office, and let's go over the bridge. There's quite a number of fish in here. And again, growing mushrooms in an entirely different way for these bags. So pretty much every square inch of this place is used for growing. Just another view. Okay, we're leaving five. Oops, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, All right. where the stormwater collection is. And let's go into six, which is another place for training. <laughs> Got some hard work in throwing power people here. I believe you're sifting out the worms. What's your main job here? Is it worm sifting or is it just the, the actual soil? The, the worms have already been um, sifted out, so we're just clearing um, the larger particles from the, uh, from the casting. Thanks. Okay, so there's more aquaponics. These were built over the weekend. Right here. These systems then will be taken apart and brought to other cities. There's um, more mushroom production. Okay, there's the digester. And we'll now we'll go out. Side. Piles of compost that actually keep the greenhouses warm in the winter. Check out one of the outdoor greenhouses, number seven. So they're always changing. Let's see what's going on in here. Pull it down. That looks great. I believe it was kale. Looks like they just harvested in greenhouse number eight.
Now it's time to check out some of the animals. Hi guys. Feeding time. As you can see, growing power just goes on and on and on. Since the number nine. Spinach. Bruno's number 10 brings us beautiful kale. Okay. Our goats. And way back in the corner, we've got bees. I guess I could show you that. I don't think there's any bees right now, but I'll go show you. Okay, this is number 14, more production, and then there's storage there, and now let's go look at the chickens. Yeah. First of all, the compost piles, finished compost. Okay, let's hear from Growing Power and Will Allen. So time is not on our side. We have to really roll. We have a lot more in our program, but time is not on our side. So we're going to move right ahead. Now, we have a special treat. Uh, Will Allen wasn't here, but his daughter is with us. And so let's welcome Erica Allen. Uh, and she's going to give us some comments, and she will make herself available after the session uh, to field some of your questions. Erica Allen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm just so honored to be here. Um, Dr. Aleem um, attended our uh, commercial urban agriculture program last year, and he was just very inspirational and humbled us all with, you know, just his presence and, um, and his commitment to the good food movement. Um, 
I'm a, the Chicago Projects Manager for Growing Power, so I'm kind of carrying on the tradition that my father has um, taken up. Um, I've operated our office here for, it'll be 10 years um, next year, and um, have been um, slowly but surely carving some inroads into developing um, community-operated food systems here. Um, so any of you who are Chicago-based, um, please come visit our new facility in um, Bridgeport on Iron Street. It's right off of 35th. Um, it's a seven-acre facility, so it would actually be a lot larger than what you just saw in the video. Um, comprehensive with the aquaponics, the vermicompost, compost, um, solar energy, anaerobic digestion, and pretty extensive youth employment and transitional job training. Um, last summer we had the opportunity here in Chicago to work with CHA, Chicago Housing Authority, and we employed 150 adults in the Alcal Gardens um, housing project, if any of you are familiar with that. It's really kind of, um, you know, a, a very uh, intense place for people to live. Um, all African American folks living, um, 2,000 people without any, any uh, grocery store within four miles and surrounded by landfills and um, coke um, uh, smelters, so all, all kinds of toxicity. And there's been several lawsuits uh, filed um, uh, on behalf of the folks that have lived there. So we had the opportunity to install a two and a half acre farm, employed 150 people to install that farm, 40 youth, and now are working, continuing to work with 10 folks um, at our Iron Street facility who will be running that farm. And that is a huge achievement that um, we were able to harness those resources and not only employ folks, um, but have folks who are really invested in the food system. So there'll be greenhouses, you know, raised beds with lots of crops that will be sold and distributed within the community. And I just picked that one as an example of how environmental racism and oppression can be counteracted by, by us and um, in, in a very holistic way. So we were able to include culinary and nutrition, just, I mean, people who had never drank, drank water, didn't understand how important it is to hydrate, didn't understand basic, basic nutrition. And to see the transformation within the community, walking to the site every day, physically using our bodies every day. So I just, you know, use that as an example, and that's, you know, a very extreme community, how this work can really, really impact but I think we're all trying to, to do to really save ourselves and save our world. Um, one of the things that I like to share, uh, my dad gave me an article that um, I think a nun from the University of um, Marquette University in Milwaukee, there was an archive from the 20s um, about Egypt and about um, vermicomposting. And at, at one time in Egypt, um, during the Pharaoh times, um, worm, vermicomposting was a state secret. It had a, a, a special priest class that tended the worms and understood that cycle of life and understanding of fertility. And it was key to the maintenance and survival of the kingdom. And we give that information away. We don't believe it should be a state secret. But it is, it's really important to understand that this information is fundamental to universal law. This is how life is created. And, and it needs to be maintained. And we're a little microcosm of the universe, right? So to understand this, we understand ourselves better and we become closer to God. So I, I, I urge you to get involved, even if it's just a little vermicompost bin in your, in your kitchen or a little garden, that you understand fertility and where it comes from and what our role is. So I just you know, welcome you all to Growing Power in Milwaukee. Come for a tour. Um, come visit our, um, our projects here in Chicago and the many, many projects across, across the country and internationally that we're involved in. You can go to our website, growingpower.org, and you know, see all the information there, and please get involved. So thank you. It's an honor to be here. So we thank her for that, and uh, I, I would request that all of you figure out when you're going to go to growing power this year. You saw a video, you heard some words, all oh, that's nice, that helps you understand a little bit, but you will not actually get it until you go there and walk through it and get your hands in that soil and see the plants and see what it's really like and what it feels like, what it smells like. You can get a little glimpse of it downstairs 
in the exhibit hall with the hoop house there, go through there, look at every single detail. Every single detail is important, and you have to learn that. But the main thing that you want to come away with is the idea, I can do that. I can grow my own food. So we're going to move ahead um, as quickly as we can. Time is not on our side. Um, all of you received something on your seat. Pull that out, please. It's called How to Eat to Live Quick Play Weekly Game Scorecard. What's that all about? Well, it's all about you. If you were playing tennis without a net, what kind of game would that be? You wouldn't even be able to tell how good you're doing. <laughs> Right? So you got to put a little barrier in there, a little difficulty factor, a little competition in there. That's how you tell whether you are doing good or not so good. Okay? So if How to Eat to Live were a game, would you be interested in playing? Yeah. I hope so. Because whether you are interested in playing the game of life or not, you're in it. And guess what? You have three worthy opponents. One is called disability, disease, and then the superstar of them all is called death. And they're playing against you hard. So you better know that you're in a game and what you do determines whether you win or lose. So if you win the game of how to eat to live, what do you get? You get life and life more abundantly. You get the freedom from sickness and disability, and uh, you can extend your lifespan. That's what you get if you win. What, if you get, what do you get if you lose? Yeah, premature death. And then pain and suffering along the way. So, we should be very, very interested in knowing how well are we playing this game. So what are the rules of the game? Well, the rules of the game are found in the books. So that's why you should read the books. The major rule is eat the right foods and fast. Eat one meal a day. Those are the major rules. Okay? If you violate those rules, you're not going to win. You're going to lose. Okay? So how is the game scored? Well, if you look at your sheet, and this is just a pilot. I'm asking you to participate with this. We're going to develop this even more. Now, you are competing not just against disability, disability, disease, and death. Actually, though, you're competing against yourself. So you'll see on the right-hand side, there's four columns representing the next four weeks. So what I want you to do, just to show you how easy it is to play, is I want you to give a flash answer to your activity, according to the questions on the left-hand side, for the previous week, last week. So, you, so what you're going to do right now is you're going to fill out that first column. That represents what you did over the last week. Now what does a flash answer mean? It means, see you can make this complicated and get out a calculator and, and try to calculate the percentage of this, that. No, 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 no. A flash answer means the first number that comes into your mind, that's the answer. So the first question, for example, says, percentage of the time in the last week that you ate one meal a day. Okay, well, what's the answer? Say, was it 60%? Was it 80%? Was it 100%? Whatever it flashes into your mind, don't think about it, just write it down. That's your score for that question. Then the next one, percentage of the time in the last week, and I think we have some slides, right, to, to show the PowerPoint. The percentage of the time in the last week that you ate home-cooked food. See, what's the flash answer? Was it 40%? Was it 100%? Okay, so just go down and answer those questions. Percentage of the days in the last week that you drank raw milk. Percentage of the days in the last week that you ate navy bean soup. Percentage of the days in the last week that you ate whole wheat toast. Percentage of the days in the last week that you ate three servings of whole fruit. Then the next question is about vegetables, both cooked and raw vegetables. 
Question number nine, percentage of time last year, now this one's a little bit different, it's the last year that you actually participated in the monthly fast. And then number 10, here is the kicker. The percentage of food that you ate while at Savior's Day that you brought from home. In other words, this question is getting at, did you anticipate the fact that you were going to be eating room service? Eating in second-rate restaurants. I saw the poor, pitiful Muslims down there at that restaurant the other day, looking on, <laughs> trying to see what you could find. Scavengers. I'm rubbing it in. I'm rubbing it in hard. <laughs> see, because we should anticipate these things. And isn't that one of the reasons we need hoop houses? So when you come to Savior's Day, we got hoop houses where we make, bring our own food. We don't have to be eating these other people's food. What's wrong with us? Well, there's a lot wrong with us, but we're working on it, right? So that's basically how you score. So what, what you should have filled out just now is that first column, and then you go down to the bonus points. Percentage of food eaten that you grew yourself. How about that? When I answered the question, I had to put zero, unfortunately. Percentage of the time that you cook for others, not just yourself, but are you concerned about feeding other people good food? Percentage of the time that you eat with your family at home. Yeah, Lord have mercy. See, that's why the family falls apart. Everybody's eating different times, different places. Okay, those, those are important things. Percent of the times in the last week that you exercised at least, well, ex exercised three times a week. That question needs to be redone, but you get the point, right? And then number 15, the number of times in the last week that you ate forbidden food. You ate them cashews. <laughs> Or worse, <laughs> that shrimp cocktail looks so good. <laughs> so score yourself, and then you can add it up to see what your score is. And you're competing against yourself. Whatever your score is this week, can you improve it by next week? And then the next week, and the next week, and the next week, so that you gradually get your score going up. And the more of the basic principles of how to eat to live you get into actual practice, then the higher your score is going to be. Now, I did a little pilot study yesterday with about 20 people. Um, and when I averaged out the score, the highest score was 1,030. One person scored over 1,000. One person got 1,000. Those were the two highest scores. <coughs> Excuse me. The lowest score was 240. So if you look at the bottom, there's an interpretation of the scores. So if you if you're scoring over a thousand, then you are living abundantly. You're actually getting it done. If you're scoring somewhere between 750 and a thousand, then you're barely living. You're making it, but not not by much. And then anything below 749 to 500, you're dying slowly, which is better than dying fast, which is where you get to <laughs> below 499. <laughs> so that poor brother, man, 240. Th this is somebody that is literally committing suicide. This is somebody that is literally doing what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that we do. We dig our graves with our teeth. Except eating as bad as he's eating, he probably don't even have teeth. So, that's the how to eat to live game. Are you willing to play? Yes, sir. Are you going to win? Are you playing to win? Yes, sir. Or playing to lose? <laughs> so, take an extra copy of this back to your home mosque. Duplicate it. 
so that others can also play. And then you can extend the game so that you could have groups or teams competing against other teams. So you could have the MGT versus the FOI. See who's closest to how to eat to live. You could have MOS number one against MOS number two. You could be a, all, all kinds of levels of competition to see who is really putting into practice the principles of how to eat to live. And then when we perfect the game, not only will we be improving our quality of life, uh, we could actually put this into the nation's program. So along with your charity and attendance and everything else, your How to Eat the Live score goes in. And then we'll be able to see, see what was the question the Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked? He says, can we survive? How strong is the foundation? Well, the foundation of our life is the food that we eat. So the nation won't survive if you don't survive. And you won't survive if you don't practice how to eat to live. Oh, I forgot to tell you, the average score from the 20 that I did yesterday, the average score was 742. So look on that legend. What does that mean? Dying slowly. So you could say that among us, we're not living. We're in a slow decline. And don't you think we should reverse that? Yes, sir. Okay. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, welcome to the How to Eat to Live game. <laughs> now, we're going to move along. Uh, I want to thank those who helped us uh, to put this on, Brother Dwayne and Brother Malcolm, Brother Asim, Brother Willie, Brother, Sister Kelly, uh, Sister Whitney, Sister Erica Muhammad, Brother Julius Muhammad, Brother Jihad, and Brother Hadil, who uh, passed out those flyers. Oh, okay, they're telling me the problem is nutrition is in the back somewhere. That's a book. And I also want to thank Sister Don, Sister Wanda, uh, Brother Kevin, Dr. Akili, Dr. Sophia, and Dr. Kermit for their um, How to Eat to Live conference calls. Have you been attending those? And Yeah, they're wonderful. Give them a hand because they do it on a consistent basis. And they deserve that recognition. And also I want to thank Sister Teresa, Sister LaDonna, uh, Brother uh, Dwayne and Brother Rudolph, uh, Brother Adima and Brother Darnell and Brother Nazim uh, for the PowerPoint presentations and all the things and even getting the game sheet ready uh, for today's distribution. So give them a hand. Now, the last segment of our program we want to present to you uh, individuals who are already doing uh, some of what we're talking about. So to my left, we have the cowboy, <laughs> Brother Kelvin and Brother Durst from uh, Houston, Texas. Uh, when I met Brother Kelvin, they had one cow, my girlfriend Tansy. And now I don't know what they're up to. He'll, he'll give us a, a report. But they're actually managing a herd of cows to produce milk for our people. So give them a hand. You're going to hear from them. And then all the way to my right is Brother John Muhammad. Not only did he do the commercial urban agriculture course at Growing Power, but he's my milkman. Uh, as you know, I run a clinic, right? And so uh, I put all my patients on raw milk. That's part of their treatment. They can't be a patient of mine if they won't drink the milk. I get rid of them because that, that lets me know they're not serious. So if I can't get them to change their eating habits and get serious about health, well, you're not going to be my patient. You're not going to walk around telling people that you go see Dr. Muhammad and you look like you look. No, you won't either. I don't have no Rudy Poots on my team. So you can start out that way, but you can't stay that way, else I get rid of you. I only have winners, no losers. Because if I put up with losers, then I'll become a loser, right? So this is Brother John Muhammad, and he's my milkman because every Monday I got patients lined up waiting in the lobby, waiting for him because he comes down from Pennsylvania with the milk. Uh, and they come in there and some of them buy 10 gallons a week, you know, because they're serious about their health. 
And so I want to have them uh, close out our session because, yeah, I can talk about theory and this, that, and principles and practice and all that, but we want to hear from people who are really getting it done. And when you look at Brother Kelvin and Brother Durst and Brother John, you're not looking at people who are better than you. That's right. They ain't smarter than you. That's right. They don't believe more than you, That's right. but they're just getting it done. And so after this session is over, go talk to them. Find out, find out what it takes to raise cows. Find out what it takes to have a milk program. Talk to them. Find out how it's done because we all have that responsibility. And so without any further delay, Brother Kelvin and Brother Durst, uh, you have a, a yes. film, right? Yes, sir. Anyhow, go ahead, brother. Thank you. Let's give Brother Aleem another round of applause, please. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness is but one God that through him and with him all things are possible, and I bear witness that Muhammad is indeed his living, his last, and his greatest apostle. We, my brothers and sisters, in the greeting words of peace, assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, I want to do just two quick points, and then I want to go to a video to bring some mass to what we're going to be sharing with you uh, this morning. Real quick, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, of course, a message to the black man that we, on page 174, economic blueprint, but that we must pool our resources. And our resources are not just money, but it's time, energy, labor, all those necessary things that will give us an opportunity to produce that which we need to produce, which is food, clothing, and shelter. Well, the thing that comes out of the land is the food, clothing, and shelter. We want to concentrate, of course, on the first thing, which is food. So the Quran, when it talks about the we, we're looking at, I'm just happen to be speaking, but it's a we that is involved in bringing um, to fruition, which you're about to see on the uh, video in a second. And that is the fact that we understood and knew that if we were to do what's necessary to provide for our own health, that we would have to do it for ourselves. And we could no longer depend on others to do for us what we must do for ourselves. So the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad actually went beyond his assignment. His assignment was to just to deliver a word. His mission was to make you and I get up through the word and do something for ourselves. But he went beyond that assignment, and he produced grocery stores, he produced farms, he produced all those things that, in truth, you and I should produce. And now today, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, just as in his father's footsteps, is really going on beyond his assignment. But if we are all here saying that we want to help, then we must get up, do the necessary things that will help, and that is to go with one another. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, six to eight of us get together and pool our resources and then do something for ourselves, that again, that will provide the necessities of life. Final point, and, and as Brother Alim said, that you are looking at a uh, person who has no, I'm an end product user. If you know anything, if anyone knows anything about business or anything, I'm an end product user. In other words, when my wife prepares the food, I go after the end product. I'm not there, and when we go out to the farm, I'm still almost an end product user. But in pooling our resources, because I didn't grow up on a farm, that was not uh, um, a thought of mine to be, you know, Mr. Green Jeans, but it was a thought that anything that was asked of me to help in this mission that I would try to do that. And so the quickest way, really, that we can show that we are helping the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is to get up and to do something, pool our resources, and in a few seconds you're going to see on the uh, thing what we did. I want, there's a couple of brothers here, because as the Quran says, it talks about we, uh, Brother Dr. Uh, uh, Brother Aline mentioned Dr. Keeley, and I see Brother Danny. The brothers who are helping with the farm, I think they're here, but we also have another workshop downstairs. Will you please stand? I would like to acknowledge those brothers who are in Houston and providing that thing. One final point, and we'll go to the thing. You know, brothers and sisters, the quickest way that we really can show that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad met with God is really to practice how to live and to try it. If you, when I say try it, Tell the lost founds to try for just 30 days. And in 30 days, whatever they can't get to the spiritual part or they can't get their studies together, in 30 days it will feel better. They will look different. They will feel different. And even on the spiritual sense, they will feel what the scriptures talks about to be persecuted for really no reason at all. Because when they look different, when they feel different, when they start abstaining from pork or some other things, and then people will tell them, what is wrong with you? And then now they will feel and have the witness bearing of what the scripture said that you will be per persecuted for no reason at all and for following me. So if we convince people to follow how they need to live, then we will convince people at the very minimum to open their mind up to th that the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad met with God. It's on the cover. If they can't read, then maybe if they practice it, they'll do it. So at this time, 
we would like to go to the video and you'll see a video of Peer Farms and what we are doing in Houston. Then we'll hear from, well, as we affectionately we call him, the farmer, Brother Kelvin. of the Nation of Islam's program centers around land, land to supply basic needs. Three hours from Chicago in Cassopolis, Michigan, is a typical Muslim farm operation managed by Brother Cornelius X. Williams. His involvement with this farm project goes back to the very beginning. We started about three years ago, shortly after I heard a teaching in South Bend. And I was interviewed by the messenger, and he was talking about he wanted to get a farm started for the, the Muslims. And I had several interviews with him, and he explained what he wanted and how he wanted it set up, and how he wanted to go about it. And then we started to purchase land in this area. The nation owns right around, it's right at a thousand acres here now. Well, it was nothing but opposition. Everybody was all shook up. Really fear, basically, yes. That's a, a great fear that they had for what they thought was going to take place. What did they think was going to take place? Well, there was many ideas, things that they said. They could, the whites, they could picture a training camp for soldiers. They thought the barns and things that we were building for livestock, we, they thought that they were going to be used for training soldiers how to fight or something. And the Negroes, they really didn't know what was going on. They were just listening to the white people. The long, cold winter does not stop work on the farm. There are cows to be milked, lambs to be fed, and eggs to be collected daily from over 23,000 hens, and stored fruit to be shipped. An 18-hour day is not unusual. Right now, things are coming along real well. We we have several things that we intend to do yet that will kind of cut down on this labor problem. It's always a problem with getting qualified help. Everybody wants to work, but basically, people don't really know how to farm the way farming is done today. See. Sure, I've always worked hard, but it's good to know that what you're working for now is, is going to someday accomplish something. When I get older, I will be stronger. They'll call me freedom, just like a waving flag.
that's just a, a brief snippet and all the things that you've seen done outside of some things we just did like we had to lay some cement some things like that it was done by the brothers and the know-how that they had so we pulled our resources not only and again our time and energy but our know-how and so was, we're still a work in progress but uh, by Allah's grace we will be better than we are today come tomorrow so with that being said I want to give you uh, and present to you the what we again affectionately call the farmer because it is his day-to-day -day activity, seven days a week, 365, well, he's not there today, so 362 days out of the year, our brothers are on the farm and providing the, not only the raw milk for us, and as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, provide for yourself, and then in what you have in excess, sell it, and then you can produce some income for yourself. So without further delay, please receive our brother, Brother Kelvin Muhammad, who is the impetus for this at Pure Farm. Assalamu in the name of Allah, the beneficence of the mercy, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his message. I greet you all in the greeting words of peace of Assalamu alaikum. Uh, real quick, I just want to say I, I grew up in the city like most of us. Uh, I, I'm not a you know, person that grew up around animals uh, just in the city. I just had dogs or whatever. But I, I think uh, what got me to the point of uh, what I believe is living my purpose in life, and I enjoy working on the farm is um, I think it was just my will to do what Allah will wanted me to do. And that's when the ministers set up the, the, the uh, nine ministries. I basically just wanted to, I, I used to say my prayers and I just asked Allah, what did he bring me for and what does he wanted me to do? I, I told I would do anything that you brought me here for, I, that's what I wanted to do. And it was from that point that I started to move towards the, the, the uh, you know, being a farmer, I had I had no blueprint or plan or on saying I'm going to be in the Minister of Agriculture and what I'm going to do, I'm going to start farming and doing. I had no I no, no you know none of that was on my plate as uh, I'm going to just I'm going to be a dairy farmer. Allah just kind of led me from day to day, you know, and uh, kind of got me to the point of where I'm at. And really, what sparked it was my wife. I don't know if she's here, but uh, it was my wife that really kind of got me into the milk because she was in the kitchen and she uh, she had we had our navy beans from the farm we had our whole wheat from the farm and she said she was looking for some whole milk and she had to tell me twice she found it on the internet where I needed to go and get the milk she had to tell me twice and when I got the milk I started reading about it and it just you know I, I knew that our people needed this and you know it was one of the three main like Dr. Leem said three main things that we needed and I just knew our people needed it. And so it was never about me. I never got in it to try to make any money. Uh, it was always like Dr. Will, I mean, Brother Will was saying on that. It's, it's, uh, you, you just know it's so important. And like you say, we're saviors. And our duty is to whatever our people need. You know, that was my thought. I'm not trying to pat myself on the back or anything. But it was just, just that will to do whatever law wanted. And I, and I found out that I actually love uh, working on the farm, I love the, the 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 whole nature thing. You know, it's just the weather. You know, it's just so important in the season. Um, but you know, it's just uh, just to just to reiterate um, that it's just that desire. And once you had a desire, the, how he says in the in, uh, message to the black man, the next thing I didn't want to. Uh, do it on my own. You know, we're supposed to pull our resources and work in a collective manner. And so, like I was telling brother before, I had the money when we got our first cow to uh, to actually, I could have got the cow and got somebody to keep it for it. And, you know, and I could have just kept the money to myself. But I, I went to the FOI and uh, some of the brothers uh, kind of encouraged me to go to the FOI uh, and, and you know to ask the brothers to raise the money for the first cow and the second cow and then brothers just out of the out of the kindness of their heart and wanted to do the work themselves started to do the farm that, that you saw on the film there but that's that's basically what it is we just gonna have to die whatever we thought we wanted to do we're gonna have to ask a lot is that what he want us to do and once you once you do that He'll take over, it like, you know, I can just bear with He'll just take over, and you'll find yourself lo uh, actually living the life you're supposed to live. Thank you, sir. Let's hear it for Brother Durst and Brother Kelvin, because they're doing it for real. 
And we just got to make sure you do make a lot of money with what you're doing, brother. How important is life? So why shouldn't he get rich? You hear what I say? This ain't slavery times no more. That, that's what put the bad taste in our mouth for agriculture in the first place. Doing all that hard work and not getting nothing. That'll put a bad taste in your mouth. <laughs> so we're going to hear uh, as our last presenter of the day, uh, Brother John Muhammad from Moss Number no. 6 in Baltimore, Maryland. Assalamu alaikum. This is a very humbling experience. It's a pleasure moment. First of all, I'd like to say I thank Allah for coming in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. I'd like to say to him, Happy Birthday. This book is from God, How to Eat to Live. You must understand that. In the back page of the paper, the final call, point number 12, we must study that point. That's a very significant point. Number 12 is a very significant number. If you do not understand that point, you will not believe that God sent this book. In the, book of, uh, in the Bible, the book of Leviticus, the 11th chapter through 16, when you read that, those chapters, you will see this book. It talks about food. It talks about legal purity. You must study that. I'm, be, I'm here before you today to thank my wife, Sister Renee, first of all. Her and I go to um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania every week. Every Monday, Allah has blessed us to connect to several Amish farmers, several of them. Brother Aleem has met one. My wife and I knows the whole family. We know their children. We know their names. We know the names of their dogs. We know the names of some of their cows. He has very beautiful property. He has orchards. He has chickens. He has herds of cows. He has a 150-acre farm. We also have a link to another Amish farmer. These people are in trouble economically, just like you and I. And one of the things that I've noticed in dealing with economics when I write this man a check every week to purchase his products for you, that's a lot of money, brothers and sisters. We must get land. We must get our farms up and running because that's the economic engine of any nation. Any nation. You study any nation in the world and look at their agricultural system you'll see where the money comes from. The very clothes that you wear, the shoes that you wear, right? What you wash yourself with, the cloth the, from the cotton, comes from land. We must be possessors of land. On page 57 of How to Eat to Live, I would like to read just a small paragraph. It says, the second paragraph, the earth is full of food, but good health cannot enter our bodies until we have the proper food in the body and the proper food for thought. If we do not have the proper food for our way of thinking, we still cannot enjoy peace, good health, joy, and gladness of heart. Study this paragraph, it's very significant. So that brings me to this. Raw milk is a very beneficial drink. The Holy Quran talks about how it's agreeable to the drinker, right? Agreeable to you. It causes you to see reality as it is because it agrees with your body. 
I remember the first time I drank raw milk. I felt an instant success in my mind, in my brain, instantly. This is what my body was craving for forever. <laughs> forever. So it's true. Why would the Holy Quran even talk about milk if it wasn't agreeable to you and I? Now, the beneficial bacteria. People often eat commercial yogurt for the friendly bacteria. But do you know that raw milk is a truly natural source of many beneficial bacteria? Pasteurized yogurt have to have the beneficial bacteria added in. Even though they were naturally presented in the raw milk in the first place. That's because pasteurization process kills the beneficial bacteria. Yet, it is these beneficial lactic acid friendly bacteria that help water off pathogens. Do you know that raw milk doesn't spoil? Spoilage occurs with pasteurized milk. Why? Because the heat process destroys all the friendly bacteria, but leaves some purifying bacteria that spoils the milk. Have you ever smelled a carton of pasteurized milk past its expiration date? That spoiled milk. However, in raw milk, the lactic acid bacteria use the milk sugar lactose as fuel and produce lactic acid as a byproduct. The lactic acid makes the milk sour, not spoiled. Sour milk, raw milk, is still a nutritious food. Sour raw milk is excellent for baking, and some people even enjoy drinking it. As raw milk naturally sours, you can also control the souring to make yogurt, sour cream, and kefir. If you're worried about your raw milk souring too quickly, never fear. Keep the milk nice and cold on the shelf of your refrigerator. It will keep that sweetness of taste. Now look at the products, and I'm gonna end on this, that you can get out of raw milk. Sour milk. You can get cream for you coffee drinkers or tea. You can make ice cream from the cream, right? Cheese, kefir, right? Butter. See, these come from raw milk. So you do the math. If you have one cow that produces 10 gallons a day, and you got 100 cows, and you charge $15 a gallon, that's just one cow. How about chickens? Right? Every fifth week, this farmer that we deal with produce 500 chicks. 500 chicks every fifth week for us who like to eat chicken. What about eggs? Huh? At $4 a dozen. Do the math. Economically, again, brothers and sisters, we can get ourselves out of the condition that we are in. We can create jobs. My wife and I have a distribution system in producing the raw milk and other products. We're about to hire somebody to help us out because I'm working the poor woman to death. <laughs> and she's begging for some relief. So I'm calling on the law to send us some help and I believe he has. So, so, brothers and sisters, I thank you for allowing me to come before you. I thank Brother Lean for this opportunity. And I thank you all again. I thank the Honorable Minister Lord Farrakhan for saving my life in 1989, January the 28th. Because <laughs> that's when I first heard him speak. Never heard the man before in my life. So, again, thank you. Happy Savior's Day. Asham Lakum. Thanks a lot. Let's hear it for Brother John, Mass number six. 
So uh, I've been uh, waiting for somebody to send me a note up here to say we have to close out. I, didn't, I haven't got a note yet, so maybe we do have some time for questions and answers, if that is acceptable. Let me uh, explain. Uh, Erica Allen has a sick baby at home, so she, she, you understand, she had to go. Okay, I thought she was going to hang around for a while, but she explained her baby's sick, so she had to go. Uh, so uh, we thank her for being on hand. But we have... Brother Kelvin, Brother Durst, Brother John, uh, and myself. So if there's anybody who has a question, uh, perhaps we can field a few questions until somebody decides to send us a note. <laughs> well, why don't you come up front, Brother, quick, quick. Come on, come on, come on. All right, sir. Where's the wrong milk at? Okay, he... Uh, he asked a question that everybody's been asking me. See, I'm not from Chicago. We in Chicago, right, brother? I'm not from Chicago. Okay, well, I'm not from Chicago. So, brother Kareem Muhammad runs the milk program in Chicago, so you should ask him. So where, where the hell's the milk? Where would I say, brother Kareem? Where is brother Green at? Is he in the house anywhere? <laughs> I, I saw him yesterday, so, uh, so when you see him, you ask him, why don't you have milk here for the believers? Because I'm mad at him. I don't want to ask him, because I'm mad. That ain't right. Got y'all eating at room service and stuff like that, when you could have had milk. That ain't right, is it? No, that ain't right. Don't act like that's right. <laughs> that's wrong. Yes, ma'am. You on, sister. Yes, sir. Okay, we have about 10 minutes, so we'll make everything real quick. Awesome, like sir. And the br brothers didn't know we were going to do this, so, you know, we're putting pressure on them to get the mics and everything. Awesome, like Dr. Lee. Some I want to know about the worms. Uh, to start a garden just in my backyard, should I buy worms? I see worms come out, you know, after it rains, so do that mean my fertile, the, the soil in my yard is fertile enough to start a garden? Well, I wish Sister Erica was here to answer that question, but it sounds like if you have worms growing in your soil, that's pretty good soil. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, if it was really toxic, they wouldn't be there. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, uh, that's fine to use those worms. But why don't you uh, make it a point to call Growing Power yes, and sir. talk to somebody who's an expert in it. I'm not an expert in it. Yes, sir. Okay? Thank you, sir. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah. I was just going to add to that. Um, if you have some worms, if you, if you take like cardboard boxes or whatever, and you lay them where you want to plant your garden, the worms will actually come up onto the, uh, underneath it, and so you have them like that. But you can buy them online too. But uh, if you have a few, lay cardboard where you're going to put your garden at the spring, and the worms will come up, and they, they like the cardboard paper. And you can purchase worms at Growing Power, and you know those are good worms. He's got 250,000 worms. Wow. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Salaam alaikum. Alaykum salam. Um, my question has to do with the law, and I'll probably ask brothers for, you know, personally afterwards, but maybe for everybody to hear. Um, I hear things in California like they're trying to make it illegal to, to grow anything in your backyard, things like that. If you could have any insight and just kind of shorten my learning curve about what to expect, um, you know, there's going to be enemies that's going to try to stop it. So I just want to know legally um, what we need to be aware of. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, and, of course, the devil is the devil, right? So the devil was mad all the way in the book of Genesis because God taught Adam how to eat, eat right. So the devil came right behind him and taught Adam to eat wrong. Okay, and that's Adam's fault. Eating wrong makes you fall from your great potential and from your great uh, life and force and power, it brings you all the way down. So that's why we can't get all the way up until we get our eating all the way up. So yes, the uh, enemy in California and in all of the 50 states, uh, they are passing all kinds of laws and sending in, uh, there was a story I just read last week in California where they sent in a, a SWAT team uh, to shut down uh, an organic uh, dairy farm and another SWAT team, there's a store that was selling raw food, and they went in there and confiscated everything because they do not want the people to have real food. I mean, that's the play. 
God wants you to eat right. The devil don't want you to eat right. So don't think that you're not in a war. You are in a war. And you have to decide whether you're willing to fight for the right to have the food that God wants you to have. Because if you lose that fight, you're going to lose your life. So uh, they passed the bill, uh, S-510, uh, which has certain provisions in it. The one that bothers me the most about it is it says that the FDA has the authority to intervene uh, in any situation that they judge to be harmful. So they don't even define what harmful is. They just say if the FDA judges it to be harmful. Well, that's a little bit too much uh, room for them to have because they would actually say raw milk is harmful. They would actually say that. So now if they come in and, and try to shut Brother John down, now see, I would, I would be upset because that's, that's my milkman. See, that's my lifeline. So now if, if they came uh, against him or, or the Amish uh, uh, dairy for farmer, Mr. Zook, see, I would be upset. And so they need to know, I'm not trying to speak for anybody, but I'm just saying I would, I would go up to Lancaster and fight them people over milk. I would. I don't know if you would, but I would because I know what my life depends upon. And I'm not going to let the enemy of God in life limit what I can have access to. That's, that's worth going to war for, isn't it? I don't know if you feel that way or not, but that's how I feel. So we might, before it's over, have to fight for the right to practice how to eat the lift. I kind of think that's true. You probably will have to do that. They'll declare you to be illegal. The, uh, that same kind of scenario takes place in Texas, however, because it is ours. They can't, what we do with our milk with one another, they can't do anything about. So the, the, the fight is really, if we get to the self, then regardless of what goes on, they can't stop you from what goes on behind your gate, if you will. And so with the, the believers will always have the opportunity to get the raw milk. All they got to do is travel, we bring it to them, and we're covered. So again, going back to what Tom Roger Muhammad said, do for self that's or right, suffer the right. consequences. Yes sir. Brother? yes, sir. My question may be best answered by the sister from uh, Growing Power, but my question was, I heard in the video that the houses were being referred to as uh, greenhouses. And are greenhouses and hoop houses the same thing? And are we able to... Um, yeah, it's just terminology. A hoop house is a low-cost greenhouse. Uh, so if you go to Growing Power, you'll see what he talked about that was built in the 20s, these A-frame greenhouses. If you tried to build one of those, uh, that would cost you a couple hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so, you know, you can do that if you want. Or you could spend $2,000 and build a hoop house. We built one in Baltimore, 60 feet long, 20 feet wide, uh, for about $1,700. Okay, so that's low cost. A group of five people, 10 people could pool their resources, build a hoop house, start growing food. You know, now you're in business because now you're harvesting, you're producing things more than you'll be able to eat. So now you're selling it to other people, and that's how you get rich. Yes, sir. For those of us who have heard about the uh, Monsanto Corporation um, and working with the FDA um, tainting the seeds, is there a place or um, a resource where we can get the proper seeds uh, to grow our own foods? Very good question. Uh, yeah, because if God planted a garden eastward in Eden, where did he get his seeds from? He didn't get them from Monsanto. I bet he didn't get them from there. So that's a very, very important uh, issue. So you can go online. You can go to uh, seed places. And you can still buy original heirloom seeds uh, that are not genetically modified seeds. And ac actually, you should do that. Uh, you, you should actually make it your business to have in your so-called survival kit, you should have those seeds because otherwise you don't have a survival kit. Monsanto has a corporate plan that according to what I read, they said by 2012, they're going to make it impossible for anybody to grow anything except by use of their seeds. And then they have seeds that, you know, they won't regenerate. So you always have to go back to them and buy some of their seeds that will only grow with the chemicals that they produce.
You see, so, so this is like the end game. We're either going to get it together in the next year or two or else forget it. Life is over for you. Yes, sir. Yes, I lost, I'm from Lakeham. I like to ask the brother, I'm an over-the-road truck driver, and I'm everywhere in the United States, basically every week. Where can I get raw milk? Where can you get raw milk? Um, right, you have a pen? What, what you need to write down is uh, uh, Weston A. Price Foundation. They have a website. I think it's westonapricefoundation.org. And you'll see uh, a link there that says, uh, oh, here, here, here it is. You can just go directly to www.realmilk.com. Realmilk.com. And that's associated with the Weston A. Price Foundation and their website. And they will list uh, sources of raw milk in the United States and in other countries as well. Uh, so wherever you're from, you'll be able to see a list of producers. And you can call them up and form a relationship. Right. Pardon? Right. Right, yeah. That's that website. It'll show you in each state. Yes. Some like them. Um, I had an experience where Terminex came and we had termites in our house and they put spikes in the ground and I was concerned I wanted to grow on that property and I asked the man do they know the chemicals that they put in and how does it affect you raising food and he said I wouldn't advise you to grow anything um, on your property after he put those spikes in but my concern is I'm wondering isn't there a way that you can like filter the, the soil or do you have to get new soil um, just wondering how can you remove that kind of chemical from your soil? Well, I would advise you to go up to Growing Power and uh, get with Will and his people. Uh, but the basic principle that Will Allen operates with is there is no soil in America that is not contaminated. There is no soil anywhere that is free of contamination, that's free of toxicity. So you have to make your own soil. Uh, there are ways to grow on top of that soil that, that you have to put a barrier there using wood chips or even just cardboard. You, you could put uh, uh, six inches or nine inches of wood chips down as a barrier so none of the contamination that's in the soil there gets into the food that you're growing. What's the point of growing food in contaminated soil? You're just growing toxic vegetables to eat, to make yourself toxic. What, that doesn't make sense, does it? Does it? Yeah, so, so you live in America. America is a toxic place. It, it, the whole environment has been defiled by a skunk. You can't grow food here unless you know how to make the soil and then grow on top of the, uh, the soil or using the same technology, did you know you can grow on top of concrete? Right. You can grow on a parking lot. You could put it up on a roof. You don't need soil. You're not going to use the soil that's here. You're going to make your own. Yes, sir. Um, when you start out with chicks, chickens, you know, I want to raise some chickens. What do I start out with? Grown chickens, little baby chicks. What do you feed them? You know how to answer that? Yes, sir. You wanted to raise them to uh, lay eggs or to eat? To eat. And probably sell some eggs. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the, the best t kind would be the, uh, they're called Rhode Island Reds. And they lay, uh, they lay well and they raise, they're, they're pretty hardy so they can withstand the weather. Uh, but I probably wouldn't recommend just trying to raise them from chicks. You, you have to have a, you know, I, w I would buy them from the feed store at, you know, about, maybe about four months old and just kind of put them on your property from there and then try to get and lay them because it's kind of hard just to start out. You won't have much success trying to just raise them from chicks on just starting out. Yeah, so it's best to, but the, the best brand, I mean the best type of chicken would be the Rhode Island Reds are the best one. I sound like, um, I apologize because I came in late and I was thinking that it sounded like you were saying 
that after you had taken the course at Hoop House, that you're now about to start some classes? And if so, will the classes that they or you offer, are they going to come to individual states, or should we be preparing to travel somewhere? I'm just trying to figure out how, you, how we get this in our everyday life and still work and do what we have to do. Okay, uh, very good question. So let me give you a little background on that. Uh, Growing Power started in Milwaukee. Uh, you heard him mention something about regional training centers. Uh, and there's 12 regional training centers around the country. So the best place to go, if possible, is to go to Milwaukee, go right to the source, and take the courses there. But there are regional training centers uh, in different parts of the country, and you can find out about them, and you can also get some training at those regional training centers. Um, one of the greatest things uh, that happened last year was uh, Allah blessed me to introduce Will Allen to Minister Farrakhan. Uh, and the minister came uh, on his bus from Chicago to Milwaukee to tour Growing Power. And then Will returned the favor and came to the minister's farm uh, in Michigan. And so they locked hands like that. And so now they're working together. So. All praises are due to Allah. So the minister said to Will Allen uh, on his farm, he said, Mr. Allen, what you see here is yours to do with whatever you see fit to do with it. And so uh, what uh, Will Allen and Growing Power are going to do is set up on the minister's farm a system of hoop houses uh, to serve as a training center eventually for the Nation of Islam. Now that might take a year or two years. I don't know how long it may actually take to be fully functional, uh, but starting this spring, they're going to be putting hoop houses on the minister's farm, uh, and eventually that's going to become a training center for all of us. But if I were you, especially if you like to eat, See, I don't know if you can wait two or three or four years till something gets set up. I think you better go figure out how to set up something for yourself as quickly as you can. Final point on that, uh, Brother John and I and uh, some of the other brothers and sisters in the nation who have learned this information, uh, we're willing to come and visit with you. Like if you have a group somewhere and you say, well, we want to build a hoop house, well, we, we'd be willing to come and spend a day and show you how it's done. You know, it's not that hard. See, it's just, it, we, everybody can learn how to do it. It's not hard. It's just somebody just has to show you the first time, and then once you get it the first time, you got it. And then you can share that information with others. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can contact us. Yes, sir. As Alaikum. Alaykum. Um, my question is, is the where I stay in Columbus, Ohio. But uh, my family have property uh, a half an hour outside of uh, Selma, Alabama. And really trying to do exactly what some of your guys are doing is actually trying, the area is in a little place called Wilcox County, Camden, Alabama. And as you know, we have uh, um, over 100 acres. And what I'm really trying to do, I'm trying to uh, collaborate with someone to try to uh, do some kind of study. Now, uh, they said that area down there were all farmland, so everything is, is available you can do, but what, what the thing I have is a brother on the panel saying that we're, I'm, I'm from the city. I have nothing to do with farming, but for the last three years, I got into community garden and found the desire and a love for it. So therefore, trying to go down there and trying to uh, cultivate that and do something with that and then trying to look how can I collaborate with someone and try to uh, see if that can be possible. Yes, sir. Uh, well, the first thing you want to do is do a, uh, a soil test on it, to, like you say, to make sure that what, what type of soil it is. And then you want to, you want to kind of find out what's generally uh, grown in your area. 
uh, and if you want, I'm not sure if you said you want to go down and, and do it yourself, but those are the first things you want to do, find out what type of soil you're dealing with, and then you want to um, find out what grows best in that area. And uh, if you really want to try to make money out of it, because a lot of farmers' markets are sprouting up around the country, is you want to kind of grow something that, that's like a specialty fruit or vegetable. And those are the ones that usually sell with the, the premium price, and you'll make a better return on it, uh, something like that. Well, one thing in that area, they do uh, farm raising fish. It's real big. Catfish is big down there. And what happened down, see, I'm like so many hours from uh, Mobile. Brent, Brent. And Brent. what happened down Brent. there with the fish industry, and that's one of the things I really was trying to get into Brent. is what. I'm trying to get, to get your attention, not to cut you off. Sounds like you need to take the growing power course. If, uh, every question that you just asked would be answered if you took the course, okay? Um, and there is an agriculture workshop that I think is scheduled this afternoon. Sounds like you need to be there, yes, sir. okay? It might yes, be going sir. on now, I'm not sure. And you can talk to Dr. Ridgely, and you can talk to many, many people who are knowledgeable about agriculture. Uh, but I just got the sign here that we're out of time. So I'm sorry we're not going to get to all of your questions. I think we can take one more, but it has to be real, real quick. But brother, you, you, can, you have a lot of resources, so not to cut you off, but just to say there's plenty of resources. You can go access them. Just get the knowledge here, then you'll be able to do it. Okay? Yes, sir. Dr. Aline, you talked about the medical benefits of the milk. And I wanted to ask, is there, is there a particular time period that you need to drink the milk? Because um, I, I don't know if I'm allergic to dairy and um, mucus buildup. Is, does the antibodies of the raw milk do something to cure that? Or do I just have to stop drinking dairy or milk, period? Well, if I, I couldn't hear very clearly, but I think you're talking about the... The mucus buildup from... The yeah, the problems that people complain about related to milk are related to pasteurized milk products. Raw milk does not do that. So the, so the difference between raw milk and pasteurized milk is the difference between night and day. I mean, you're looking at somebody who literally stayed away from milk for 30 years because I thought I was lactose intolerant. And come to find out, I wasn't lactose intolerant. I was just drinking the wrong milk. But when I got the real milk, the milk that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad talked about and that Allah talks about in the Holy Quran, I love it. And so even though Brother Kareem didn't bring milk for the Savior's Day, I brought my own milk. <laughs> now, I ain't playing. I know how things are sometimes. And I can't stand no room service, so I put the milk in my luggage. That's right. And I travel with it. That's right. That's right. I'm serious about this. So we've had a wonderful time, at least I have. I hope you have. We've been saying happy Savior's Day. Are you happy yet? Yes, sir. I'm very happy. Yes, sir. So may Allah bless us and keep us uh, uh, as we continue to enjoy our wonderful Savior's Day Convention 2011. And, of course, there's many, many activities that are going on. Please make sure you take advantage of everything that is being offered of good here at our Savior's Day. Thank you. May Allah bless us. Assalamu alaikum.